I am grateful to be invited to give a keynote speech to the LIFT conference two years in a row. <coughs> Last November, I spoke from my experience living and working in other Asian countries for the past 12 years. Today, I will compare that experience with what I observed in Myanmar over the past 12 months and present a message of excitement, hope, and talent. Before turning to Myanmar, I review from my observations from Bangladesh, China, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. From field interviews with 10,000 persons in all the segments of food value chain. From input suppliers to farmers to wholesalers and logistic firms to processors and to retailers and to exporters. This is what we found. The rapid transformation of the Asian agricultural and food economy has been based on a food security success triangle with three corners. The first corner of the triangle has been a profound and rapid transformation of rural urban supply chains, which we call a quiet revolution in value chain. This transformation has been led mainly by a huge surge in grassroots investment by hundreds of thousands of small and medium enterprises all along the value chain, from upstream in the value chain in equipment and machine rental, seed and fertilizer and chemical supply, irrigation installation, fish pond excavation, to midstream in the supply chain in trucking, processing, cold storage, warehousing, and wholesaling. Multinational corporations have played only a minor role in the quiet revolution. And government marketing agencies have played nearly no direct role in this revolution in value chain. The transformation has been driven by policies of market liberalization in all the countries, of road and electricity uh, investments by governments, and by the fast increasing demand from urban market growth. Trade has mainly played a minor role so far. Imports and exports are only 5% of the overall food economy of Asia. The second corner of the triangle is the modernization of Asia's small farms with rapid intensification of technology and commercialization. The farmers themselves have converted their traditional farms into small-scale businesses. Around the region, hundreds of millions of small-scale farmers have invested in irrigation, farm machinery purchase or rental, and use of fertilizer, improved seeds, and chemicals. The results have been leaps and bounds in productivity and farm income. The third corner of the triangle has been the diversification of rural livelihood. Millions of small farmers have diversified their livelihoods by moving beyond just rice production into vegetables, oil seeds, fruit, dairy, livestock, fish, pulses, and corn or maize. This choice of what farmers are doing with their land labor and money is driven by several facts. The first fact is that non-rice products earn farmers in Asia two to five times higher gross margins compared to rice. The second fact is the trend of long-term stagnation and decline in rice consumption per capita in Asia, pointed out by Peter Timmer of Harvard. This implies that rice prices, rice prices will plateau or decline over time in absolute terms. And 10% is exported. Although there are excellent prospects to increase fish exports. But often in policy discussions, there's a focus on export markets only. When in fact, the domestic market is just as exciting, if not more. 
We've observed that over the past decades, clusters of fish ponds, both small and medium and large, have spread very rapidly over the Delta region. There's been a spread of private hatcheries and nurture, nurseries, of small and medium feed mills, of wholesaling and trucking and specialized boat services for transport of fish to Yangon and Mandalay and Shan markets. We have observed rural migrant remittances and local farmers' cash invested into excavating ponds. We have observed laborers flocking to the fish zones for the year-round work. The development of this sector is truly stunning and rivals at takeoff stage what I've seen in Indonesia, Bangladesh, and China. This is good news for fish farmers and for poor consumers for whom fish is the main source of protein. A similar fish sector revolution started in Bangladesh a decade earlier and turned around a situation which had been described as a fish price crisis in the 1990s into an affordable fish situation available year-round to the poor in the 2000s. We think Myanmar has embarked on the same path. The chicken sector is also developing in Myanmar, especially in the Yangon and Mandalay areas. Remember, all around Asia, two-thirds of the market is urban, and people are eating as much chicken and fish in expenditure terms as rice. This is a massive market, and it's growing much faster. Now, this rise of the chicken and corn dual sector in Myanmar mirrors the experience of the rest of Asia in the past 15 years. Chickens raised intensively eat feed made from corn or maize. It's thus no surprise that the production of corn has skyrocketed in a short time in Shan and Dry Zone. Half of the corn is exported to Asian countries, half goes into Myanmar chickens. I think the share to Myanmar will rise over time as chicken consumption here catches up with the Asian norm. The rapid rise of corn production here mirrors what happened in China, and Thailand, and Vietnam. In China, for example, corn was a tiny share of the rice acreage in 1990. Now, more corn than rice is grown in China. <clears throat> this dual development of chicken and corn is a basic agricultural development motor throughout Asia. Poor consumers gain because the price of a main protein source is driven down over time. Logistics and processing and wholesale actors and laborers they employ are benefited as employment and supply chains rises. Corn and chicken production has also been a door into increased contract farming by local and regional companies, reducing risk to farmers and providing them a premium. The third example is the horticulture sector, which is yet another emerging success story in Myanmar. There is justifiable excitement about initial breakthroughs in exporting mangoes and melons and other fruit. This initial success will only be magnified and accelerated as domestic and international companies increasingly uh, invest and help local farmers with know-how. To witness the export story, I had only to travel the road from Mandalay to Lashio to Muse last December and watch hundreds of trucks move from thousands of farms in the dry zone to the vast China market. And then stand, I stood and watched 300 trucks each morning sell $8,000 per truck of melons on the border, generating a river of cash going back, to the, uh, back up the supply chain to rural areas in the dry zone. But my excitement has not been limited to observing the export value chain. In fact, the great majority of vegetables and fruit grown in Myanmar go to city markets in Myanmar, diversifying diets and raising nutrition of poor consumers. To witness the emerging horticultural value chain revolution uh, to Myanmar cities, I had only to sit last February in a large 
tomato wholesale warehouse on the share of Lake Inlay. The tomato trader had recently invested in a fleet of boats and was loading trucks bound for the Yangon market. He noted that a dozen years before, there had been one such warehouse, and now there are 30. That, dear audience, is a sign of the quiet revolution starting. With the heroes, the thousands of farmers, and irrigation pump salesmen, and truckers, and wholesalers, and retailers who are building this success. Second, I'll give you emerging cases we observed in Myanmar of beneficial links between this value chain development and crop diversification on one hand, and rural livelihoods on the other. A first aspect of livelihood impact is that agricultural diversification and commercialization help rural poor laborers. They increase local labor demand to pick and pack and transfer fruit, to attend to fish ponds all year, to harvest and transport maize, and so on. Horticulture in particular is very labor intensive and is known throughout developing countries as an employment generator in rural areas. How this is happening in Myanmar came to us in a flash in a discussion with tea plantation managers in Shan. They noted how much of a shock to them it has been to see a doubling, a doubling, a doubling over the past four years of the wages they have to pay the tea picker migrants from the dry zone. We asked them why, and they said, it's all due to the fruit and vegetable boom in their own dry zone. That's driving way up the demand for labor there, and so now we have to compete and pay them higher wages. We heard this story all over the country. Think of how good that is for the poorest people of Myanmar, the landless rural workers. But there's also a challenge inherent in this story. As the cost of labor increases, we observe and are told by farmers that the use of small-scale farm machines is rising swiftly. We observe that in the Delta in Shan. Michiko Ito of EOM, IOM told me of how the villagers described the massive shift away from animal traction to tractors in the eastern Shan villages she has worked in. See, they said, we're shifting from a water buffalo to a Thai buffalo, the Thai buffalo being Thai farm machines. This appears to be the start of a similar shift that's occurred in the early to mid-2000s in Bangladesh and in China where small farmers with farms much smaller than in Myanmar shifted massively over to renting small tractors and attachments <laughs> used for farming and for transport to product markets and employment in rural towns. However, this will also mean a difficult transition period for the poorest farm laborers lacking skills, seed capital, and education to transition to better employment. This will be an inevitable challenge in Myanmar to address over the next decade. <coughs> a second aspect of market change on local livelihoods is that income from migration and these new agricultural incomes are feeding the growth of local non-farm employment. This is stunningly clear to us when we were on, were on the roads in southern Chan observing literally hundreds of small construction sites, additions to homes, re-roofing and transport jobs with hundreds of small tractor pull vehicles, but nearly no bullock pulled carts in sight. This rise of rural non-farm employment again shows Myanmar starting to converge with the normal trend in other Asian countries, where rural non-farm employment is now 40 percent of rural incomes, actually much higher than migration income, except in a few areas. It will be increasingly important for livelihood development to train and equip rural households to enter this kind of employment. A third aspect of livelihoods links to market transformation 
uh, is that migration and rural non-farm employment are themselves important sense, uh, sources of investment capital for farm productivity and value chain investments. A stunning fact, a stunning fact, is that remittances from Myanmar citizens in international migration are estimated at eight billion dollars a year. That's nearly the total official value of exports from Myanmar. Add to international my remittances, the largely uncounted internal migration remittances from the thousands of rural migrants in Yangon and Mandalay, or dry zone migrants in Mon or Shan or the Delta. And then add to that again a sizable amount that must come from rural non-farm employment of rural laborers commuting to the local towns to work. Together, these three sources of off-farm cash earned in migration in the local and in the local non-farm sector are fundamental sources of investment capital for rural development. For, from our field work, it seems that at least part of these cash resources are used just for that. We found in Bonn and Delta that fish ponds were being dug and Sean irrigation and, pumped and pumps and tractors bought and housing construction undertaken, financed by remittances. Experience in other Asia, regions of Asia is again telling. Investment from migration remittances and local non-farm income have been fundamental factors in the transformation of rural areas in the Philippines and in China and in Bangladesh. Governments in these countries have seen this inflow as a potential bonanza for rural areas, but they've been worried about how to create the incentives for reinvestment and lowering the risk. The Mexican government, and now following them, the Philippine government, have set up a three plus one program where the government matches remittances uh, based investments three to one, leveraging that investment. Leveraging a flow as big as all of the exports of Myanmar. Rural banks have set up programs to cater to these flows. In the end, the business climate of profitability and risk will determine where big migrants reinvest their cash. To that business climate, I turn in the final portion of my talk, suggesting a few strategies. To this point, I made the case that Myanmar has indeed started on the path of transformation of its agri-food sector. With initial progress in all three corners of the triangle of success I introduced at the start of the talk. In this last part of the talk, I'd like to just suggest two strategies to encourage that rapid transformation while promoting pro-poor inclusive development in Myanmar. Of course, the application of these strategies will need to be adapted to the very different kinds of zones and capacity of, and of different socioeconomic groups and strata in the rural areas. First, it is crucial for policymakers and international partners to encourage and leverage the emergence of the transformation. The takeoff speed and altitude of that transformation and its inclusiveness of the poor will depend a lot on the business climate for the thousands of small and medium investors. The hundreds of thousands of farmers who want to act like and earn like small businesses and small and medium rural business entrepreneurs in agricultural services and supply chain services. The generation of local employment, the generation of local employment, will depend on their investments and the hiring they do. They are the heroes. How to help them? The sex success of large investors will, in the end, depend on whether there are investments by farmers and clusters of local services needed to grow and move the product. Now, while there is a good and active discussion of the business climate for foreign direct investment, it is just as or even more important to have an intense and evidence-based 
policy discussion about the business climate for the small and medium enterprises, the small farms. I'm counting small farms as small businesses and off-farm businesses all along the supply chain. And it seems to me the issues to focus on for that business climate are the following. How free are they to choose the products they grow? Or are they limited to patty by law? How easily and at what price can they get complementary capital credit from banks and microcredit institutions? How risky are their investments? Or can they get titles to land whether they're rice farmers or not? Even though our work shows how profitable and growing are the beyond rice diversification options. How accessible are output, output markets to these farmers? Or are they constrained by poor roads in electricity access? Sometimes a good road is the difference between an area being a hinterland area and being a dynamic area. Witness a story I heard recently of chin farmers bringing baskets of oranges on their heads down mountain paths. What a difference an opening up of the area with a good road would make. Another policy issue is how close and well equipped is the nearest rural wholesale market. Rural wholesale markets have been an absolutely fundamental part of the success story of the takeoff of Chinese and Thai farming. How accessible are input markets for fuel, electricity, machines, fertilizer, good quality certified seed for patty, and also for vegetables? How much information can these actors get about investors and contract farming companies to help them? How much information can they get about new technology, not just in patty farming, but also non-rice production, into packaging and processing and sorting and cooling and other technologies for the various services along the supply chains. All these policy questions treat small and medium rural entrepreneurs as small businesses building diverse portfolios and expecting good returns and low risk. Second and finally, to complement the promotion of small and medium enter enterprise and job creation, it's important to match that with interventions that help landless households and others participate profitably in the changing rural economy. This will both speed up the overall transformation of agriculture and supply chains by supplying these transformations with labor and grassroots cash investments, and will ensure fewer people are boxed out, excluded from participating in this new boom. Two kinds of policy interventions can be useful. The first is to enable employment diversifications, such as with credit and job training for rural non-farm activities like construction and food preparation and processing. The second is to enable labor mobility, providing better information about distant opportunities ensuring people can get national registration cards and passports if they want them, enabling access to public services and destination sites, enabling access to financial services, savings and credit to enable migration. Thank you very much for your attention.